Hi guys, welcome back to my Steps to Sobriety, my show on YouTube and as a podcast with me, your host, Stefan Neff. Today, I'm honored to have a perfect being with me. Yeah, I hear you thinking already there is not such a thing, but I actually have the perfect daughter uh, with me today. I've got Mich uh, Michelle Lange uh, with me. Michelle is... Uh, uh, a lady who will share her journey with us today. And she is the perfect daughter. Uh, in my book, My Steps to Sobriety, I uh, also described the children of alcoholic families as the silent generation. And the perfect daughter and the silent generation goes well. And you will see by the end of this discussion what the implications are for children who grow up with mummies and daddies that enjoy the bottle far too much. So, Michelle, thank you so much for coming onto my show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate this. Mm. The perfect daughter. Huh. Um, it is. There is actually a book out there, Perfect Daughters, which is a fantastic book to read, which goes far more in depth uh, in uh, about what we are talking today. But it is, it is a matter of fact that there are about one in five people out there are alcoholics. And we all more or less sooner or later have children. And these children often enough do grow up in, in a very addicted household. And I think that was pretty much a story, your story, isn't it? Are you happy to share a little bit how your youth was? Yeah, I I actually had an amazing youth, uh, to be honest with you. I, you know, I think that, you know, when I say, oh, I had an alcoholic father, you know, immediately I think people's heads go to, oh, man, that must have been so awful. But, um, you know, when you're in a situation um, and you're witnessing a parent and behave like that at a young age, you don't actually think it's awful. You think it's normal. But my dad was an amazing father. He, uh, despite suffering alcoholism, gave us an amazing childhood. He put his children first. Um, he worked hard. He would come home every day and ensure that we had what we needed. And uh, he was he was so proud of us at all times. Mm. And you knew that. like, and, and people around knew that. So I think that growing up, uh, initially, like if I were to look at, you know, what my childhood looked like, it was a great childhood. It just was an unpredictable childhood at times, um, where <laughs> yep. I didn't know what was going to happen. Like, was I going to come home from school for lunch that day? Um, as we did, my brother and I would come home from school to make French fries. I can every single day and watch the Flintstones and, you know, was my dad going to be passed out on the couch um, or was he going to be near the end of that, you know, the drinking fest that he started at 11 in the morning, you know, at 1230 he was blitzed and, and I wasn't sure if he was going to get mad at me or, or did I do something wrong or shit, did I not clean up, you know, something. Um, so it was very unpredictable and it got, it just got worse. Uh, and thankfully, I had, uh, a, you know, my mother who is, um, you know, a saint, really. Um, and she was the pillar of our home and, uh, you know, still is the pillar of our family. But she was the one that provided that stability. So you, you got unpredictability, stability. It was, I always felt like I just, each day, it was always a question of what is this day going to bring? We were never sure, and it just got worse. Uh, did your dad work? He did. My dad worked full time. Um, you know, at a very he had a very good job, uh, full time, and you know, con functioning alcoholic. So he would wake up very early, five o'clock in the morning, be at work at six. Um, you know, be done work by two, and start drinking at the local pub. Um, or if he had his lunch at 12, would never go back to work because he was the boss of his area. Mm. So he just wouldn't go back to work. And all of his, uh, you know, the people that worked under him all loved him and revered him. He was such a, he was someone you liked being around at all times. So, you know, all of those guys, they wouldn't want to, 
you know, get him in trouble because he was fun and he, we, they would all come back to my house after work, during work. It didn't matter. Um, you know, my house kind of seemed to be the hub where things just happened. And, uh, you know, my mother ended up leaving my dad when I was 17 and my brother was 12. And that's when things really got bad. So my dad um, stopped going to work at that point um, and the drinking got worse. Um, and uh, eventually, uh, you know, they've sold our house that we, I grew up in my brother and I grew up in, they sold that. My dad got a little apartment and just, it was really a nosedive to be quite honest with you. Um, it went from, you know, this man that everyone wanted to be around at all times, fun, amazing to the alcohol, just like just destroyed him and changed who he was. Um, years later, he got himself back. Like he was better. Like he, he was working full time. He moved to a different city in the province he was doing really, really well. He had a, a good job. He, you know, went back to school and became an electrician um, and did well. Uh, worked for the Canadian Space Agency. Um, oh. Had a lot of really good people that were around him. But, you know, always that, that demon on his back, you know, the alcohol. And it just, it just kept creeping in and creeping in. And eventually... You know, it got to a point where he was living downtown Ottawa in a fairly, you know, in government housing, um, you know, cockroach, bed, bed bugs, um, just, you know, trying to survive day by day. And unfortunately, he lost his life, you know, at the age of 65. Um, and I do believe that the alcohol was the main factor in that. Mary, sorry to hear that. Yes. But the reality is that this is on the cards for every alcoholic. It is, we all stop drinking one day and some of us are still alive when we do and some of us are not alive. Mm -hmm. And it is, in all fairness, it, this kind of life you have described is very much the same life that millions and millions and millions mm -hmm. of other uh, children would have considered normal. And I don't mm -hmm. think my child was my childhood was very different. Uh, certainly, the first four years that I can barely remember, but they were, with hindsight, they were tinged in absences of my father gambling and drinking. And then when he was home, then there were fights with my mum. And I remember the one thing I do remember at a very early age was that coffee cup flying this way, and then there came. Uh, a container of cocoa, so, so milk chocolate, and it was mm -hmm. open and it sort of flew through the air and the cocoa sort of came out as a big sort of kind of thing that was imprinted in my brain. And it is sort of, yeah, and I thought, wow. And in reality, it was a major fight going on that yes. my brain had completely pushed aside. So the cocoa remained a fight. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And just that makes me wonder where there's so many fights that my brain, my young brain, did not even register that as such. Well, I um, remember you just you just made me remember something that's clearly stuck in the back of my brain. But every Sunday, my mother made roast beef, mashed potatoes, Yorkshire pudding, gravy, <laughs> carrots. That's yeah. what we had. And they must have been in a fight. My dad would have been drinking. And my mom didn't like him drinking, you know, to excess. And... I was out with my friend Roberta and we were out milling around the neighborhood. When we came back, my mom and my dad had been into a fight and her brand new Ked sneakers were at the, at the base of the door. And my mom threw the entire roast beef at my father and it went flying through the air, <laughs> hit the door, fell down. And I remember like, oh my God, Roberta's shoes, her brand new shoes. <laughs> exactly. And I was so worried about those shoes. You know, I'll have to ask her, did, did, did roast beef get on those shoes? But, you know, we, that, that, those sorts of things, um, 
you know, I look, I look back on, I remember walking down the hall one morning and there was a big hole in the wall. And I asked my mom, I said, how did that hole get there? And she was like, Oh, it was a hockey stick. And I was like a hockey stick. And she was like, yeah, the hockey stick went through the wall. And now I'm literally like this, just you telling me this story about the, the milk is making me wonder what was the hockey stick going through the wall for? Exactly. Why? Exactly. You know? And sadly enough, I, I then continued that journey because down the line, when I was drinking, I remember vicious rows between my wife, who was drunk, and I, who were drunk. And I remember literally one day throwing an electric guitar just straight through the kitchen. And, mm-hmm. and the amount of holes, I don't know, probably four or five holes over my lifetime that I made into, into walls. And you just sort of think, with hindsight, oh boy. Mm-hmm. So there's unfortunately, of course, the story that that generations continue to to perpetuate the same behavior, mm-hmm. un- unless something really happens that that changes that. Um, and there's, of course, you could you could talk a lot now about the genetic predisposition uh, when it comes to alcohol, because unfortunately there are fifty plus genes that are involved in that, and I'm pretty certain, well, I know for sure that I uh, have got some hand me downs from my father and my mother, which set me up yeah. to have uh, this beautiful dopamine response uh, that then causes our reliance on alcohol as as a crutch, as a friend, as a whatever. So yes, that is definitely there. But here we are, here we are talking about it in a very different way and with an insight that maybe some of the viewers and listeners don't have out there. So obviously something changed. But before we get there, uh, how was your youth when you got a bit older? Did alcohol play a role for you? Um, you know, when it was time, you know, when you were allowed to start drinking, you know, I likely started drinking as a, as a teenager, like all teenagers do, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah. it's hard to talk about that because I really feel like there was really nothing unique about my drinking, um, as a teenager. And I don't think there was anything unique about my drinking, even as a early adult, like in my early twenties, um, because it is so socially acceptable to go and do all of these things. And I worked as a, as a bartender Mm. and I would always set aside, you know, if I made a hundred dollars that night, I would set aside, you know, 30 for drinking that night. (laughs) So it was always like a 30%, like how much money I made, that's how much I could drink. And as bartenders and servers and waitresses, mm. we, I think, I used to think everybody did that. But as I say that right now, I'm thinking that's probably not normal, mm. but would have been very socially acceptable in that environment. Not Exactly. Exactly. When you look at, at people who walk, uh, who work in the restaurant business or any kind of, of, of uh, client service uh, business, there is so often alcohol, uh, uh, an integral part of that life. Mm-hmm. And it is part of socializing, of especially in a high pressure environment uh, such as restaurants and bars, etc., where everyone wants it now, 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 and mm-hmm. and there can be a lot of tempers going mad. And how better to debrief than have that drink? So absolutely, and, and sometimes and, you were drinking with the clients. <laughs> well, exactly, like, exactly right. You shop for me. <laughs> And the client feels special, he is acknowledged, yes. therefore he comes back. So there is something, there's a business sense behind that mm-hmm. to actually mm-hmm. do that. So please, so you were a good businesswoman, you were acting in the interest of the, of the bar that you were. So there are all these, these arguments which actually make it not just acceptable, but actually desirable. Mm-hmm. to drink alcohol you prove yourself you prove, you prove yourself as a as a woman yeah she mm-hmm. can hold her liquor and mm-hmm. all that it is oh another guest has in the past described it as in her environment uh people wouldn't trust her if she wouldn't drink mm-hmm. what do you mean she doesn't get plastered she doesn't get shit-faced 
what uh, she, is she thinking she's better than us? Oh, oh, you know, she wouldn't get promoted. She wouldn't get anywhere. Oh, I relate to that. And I think a lot of people relate to that because, um, you know, I go through periods of time where I don't drink anything at all, um, at all. Um, and I think that some of my friends don't want to be around me, to be honest with you, because it's, I'm not as fun. I'm a little <laughs> bit more boring. Um, and no, no, Michelle, no, 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 no. You are taking away the excuse for them. They need an excuse to drink. They need to feel that it is absolutely normal to drink. So the moment you don't drink, you are scratching on that surface. You're trying to pull their mask down. And that's what an alcoholic hates. Mm -hmm. An alcoholic does not mm -hmm. want to face the reality. So therefore, mm -hmm. you surround yourself with every, every, anyone and everyone who drinks yes. more or at least as much as you so that you have good excuses. Yes. Okay. Yes. And actually, we, I was just talking about that with a friend the other day about um, I don't smoke, but um, she smokes. And and I said, you know, do you find yourself like you surround yourself? She goes, yeah, like when I'm not with people that don't smoke, I don't smoke. But when I'm with people that smoke, I smoke. Um, and she says it's just really about who I'm around and the social situation that I'm in. Mm. And I said, it's really interesting because drinking is the same way. Um, you know, I have a girlfriend of mine that she does not drink. Well, she does, you know, the odd time she'll have a glass of uh, vodka with juice or whatever. But I find that I just, you know, I wouldn't normally just, I wouldn't drink the whole bottle of wine when I'm with her. I would have mm. one glass of wine. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Then you have got more uh, willpower than I had uh, because mm. that bottle of wine would be finished if the friend joins me or not. That's just right. up to him. Okay. And of course, I would try to be a good, good host and would like try to top up his glass. Mm. And whilst I'm topping, topping him up, of course, I top mine up. And it is that kind of a, of a bizarre behavior. I was always considering myself the perfect host, so I would I would put on a lavish kind of spread, food, chips, dips, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, there would also be lots of wine and or other things, depending upon the season and depending on the circumstances. There's all kind of, of yummy things you can drink. Mm -hmm. and, and when I say yummy, the initial glasses i guess you still taste thereafter mm -hmm. you might as well drink turpentine or right. <laughs> drain cleaner uh right. because ultimately the only thing you want is get blasted so let's be honest yes. here <laughs> well for me it's it's mostly and again you're talking about willpower but mm. uh, for me i don't consider it willpower i consider i don't ever like the feeling of being out of control ah. um, because i truly believe that you know in that environment that i grew up in um, I was never really in control. And so when I have the control, I use that control. And even that, even if I'm having a glass of wine or two or three, I have the know-how to make sure that I'm drinking water in between, or I'm not Excellent. drinking, you know, I would never drink and drive like all of those things. However, it's, it's, I'm in control, but then there's this part over here. That's like, I'm right there. I could be out of control right there. And that's scary to me. It's it's so close. It's just uh -huh. exactly you know. So not quite addicted. <laughs> it's <That> weird. Is... <laughs> like I feel like I you know I sit there and I say it and you know and you talk about you know you know you drink a bottle of wine like you know my doctor says you know how much do you drink I am always like well I have to lie because uh. um, she's going to think that I'm an alcoholic. Um, but I mean, if the shoe fits, <laughs> so true as a, right? as a, as a doctor, as a younger doctor, despite of all my drinking, I always had the cynical attitude that whatever a patient says times two times three is oh. probably the right ballpark. And there is a beautiful definition of an alcoholic that is someone who drinks more than his doctor. Uh. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, 
All we right. are Check. <laughs> exactly, exactly right. So every single person in this world, I think, has got the same desire to avoid pain and to seek pleasure. So that's a given. And that same drive is there for doctors, for nurses, for policemen, for everyone who's working, especially in, in demanding at times terrorizing jobs mm -hmm. and uh, there is there is very much a hard drinking culture uh, part and parcel of that and there was mm -hmm. certainly there was certainly the 70s 80s 90s no question asked nowadays different generations are coming through who have got a far stronger emphasis on the sport uh, etc they still do drink but certainly not to the excesses that were considered normal and part of your working mm -hmm. life uh, let's say one generation back right but then again we need to say that the alcohol industry is quite keen to attract this clientele as well so mm -hmm. what do you do if if beer has too much calories and wine ah, oh, far too much sugar we don't want carbs in there well we take water we carbonate it cheapest chips then we mm -hmm. put some artificial flavors in a bit of lemon flavor mm -hmm. and we put alcohol in so four ingredients are all dirt cheap. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to sell it as hard seltzer. No carb. You can drink as much as you want. It doesn't Absolutely. go into your fitness pal. Um, That's right. That's true. <laughs> exactly. It's true. It's, it's, I mean, it's brilliant marketing. Huh? Um, but unfortunately, <laughs> it's going to kill people. And unfortunately, um, it could end up being a, a situation where many of them become alcoholics and, mm -hmm. and ruin families. And mm -hmm. yeah. um <laughs> that's exactly. i never even really thought about it that way mm. <laughs> and it's i wrote in my book uh, my steps to sobriety i wrote that alcohol is the perfect solvent it dissolves bank accounts marriages mm. lives and that is unfortunately so true so true mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. your father did he ever seek help did he ever or did people offer him help do you know? Yeah. So when I was uh, 15 or 16, I remember, um, you know, things had gotten really, really bad. One time he barricaded my brother, myself and my mom downstairs in the basement. My brother hid in the closet and he had a knife and he had us all three down there. And I was old enough, like I was 14, 15 at the time. Mm. I was old enough to know this isn't right. Like this is, this is bad. And, um, you know, I think my mother phoned, you know, his work and said he needs to be put through a, a program. Mm. Um, I could be wrong about that, but um, he, I remember him going through a program and he was going through withdrawals at home mm. um, on the couch and it was bad. Like he was gray, like, um, Oh, I can't, I, I can still picture this, the color of his and clammy of his skin. Mm. And he was shaking and he was, he was freezing. And I remember my brother had a, a hockey game and my mom's like, we got to hurry up. We got to go to hockey. And I said, no, I'll stay and take care of dad. And my dad's like, no, no, you go to the hockey game. And I covered him with blankets, but he was still so cold. Um, and, you know, he went through those withdrawals and I want to say he made it like maybe a week or two. I know that sounds so um, not really worth anything to talk about, but I remember Please. being really proud of him. Please. And I remember he had a token because he was um, in a program. I don't, it, maybe it was AA, mm -hmm. um, but he was in a program. And then I remember one day he came home and he was blitzed. And it was shortly after this. And he said, there's a bunch of drug addicts in there. They're not like me. They're drug addicts. I'm an alcoholic. They have problems. I just, I like, I like beer and rye and I like to have fun with my friends. And what's so wrong with that? And again, being a 15, 14, 15 year old, I did anything to, yeah, dad, you, you know, I know dad, you, it's okay. It's okay. And I was just making sure that he was okay. And, mm -hmm. um, and I assured him that he hadn't done anything wrong at that time. Mm. But I remember that very, very, very vividly. How were you supposed to know? 
how were you supposed to how to behave? You were a loving daughter and you revered him and you you wanted to be there for him. That is, you showed your love in that way. There is no right or wrong in showing love. And you did what you did. And it is absolutely beautiful, beautiful. You were there for him. And I'm sure that meant the world, that meant the world for him. Because when you are in that situation, you are, you are so full of shame and guilt. You feel the biggest failure. The, the darkness in his soul would have been mm -hmm. drenching out every single ray of light. But you gave him that, that ray of light. You had that little light, that little candle there that you showed him the love, which is so absolutely beautiful. So, and it is, that is what happens with alcohol. It is such a powerful, powerful, powerful thing. And 80%, that is the chance of relapse in the first year. So oh. your dad was absolutely normal. What was not right was that he did not, that he did not get told that, that it's normal mm -hmm. to fail, that you expect to fail. You need right. to fail and you need to learn why you have failed. Uh, in my first year, I had a relapse. I, uh, I got drunk one night and I was mortified the next morning. And my wife just turned around and said, brilliant that that happened. Okay, so what can we learn from it? Mm -hmm. What happened? What did we not do? Mm -hmm. And I thought, what the hell? What the hell? And it was not necessarily a, a relapse. It's worthwhile to distinguish that. A lapse is if you get blitzed. A relapse is if you go completely full into the behavior, like hiding it and, and right. going for days and etc. cetera. Right. It's the whole additional behavior there. So I like to, to draw a line there. Um, uh, or at least consider the spectrum of sorts. Mm -hmm. But the, for me, that lesson was so beautiful that my wife said, okay, why did that happen? Um, obviously, there is somewhere we still need to do work or where, what can we do to get that better? And that is the, the powerful, powerful thing that, that it's such a shame that your father did not hear that message if someone said it. I don't right. know if they did. I think that in the, you know, the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, um, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong here, but I feel like what we know about alcoholism and how to, how to help an alcoholic and the resources that we have are different now. And it's, and it would be okay for people to talk about it. And, and the reason why I say that is, you know, my brother is an alcoholic and um, he's been sober now for five years uh, with um, no relapses um, and that no you, lapses. That, that you know of. Right. And um, he, has, he has transformed his life, him and his wife, actually, both of them. Um, and I think she's at seven years. Oh. Um, and they, they, they have a very full life um, that does not involve alcohol. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that they had resources, uh, and they had each other, um, but they also had a, a group that they went to every morning. They woke up in the morning, they went to that group. And I think that, that, that support network is key. And I don't know if, well, a, I don't know if my mom would have known how to support someone. I mean, she, was young herself. And I mean, she didn't know and she's trying to raise two kids and work full time. And then my dad's friends, certainly they would have been just, they would have scoffed their noses at that. They would not have wanted that. Whereas nowadays, I think that people would say, you're right. You have a problem. It's, it is much more acceptable to say that mm -hmm. in, in 2020 versus in 1993. So true. Absolutely true. There's no doubt about that. We mm -hmm. we have nowadays, there's so much wrong with the internet and with the, the way we get our information, but there's also so much right with it. And this is mm -hmm. one of the things that people who 
have got the inkling that there is something wrong in their life. They don't need to go far. We have got nowadays many meetings, especially during COVID, are online. So we have got uh, Smart Recovery, AA meeting, ma- meetings, many other meetings are there. Mm-hmm. Podcasts like mine here, the messages that we bring out there, they are all easily accessible. And mm-hmm. you're right. So therefore, uh, we are blessed that we try to bring these these taboos out of mm. the closet and yeah. that we talk and about stigma. it yeah exactly please and the stigma is still there please please mm. please don't get me wrong it is it is whilst we do all this work here a little bit of me with every podcast with every every youtube video i make is thinking Oh my God! Should I really sh- should I really admit to that 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 I'm an alcoholic? And then then I know this is this weird voice there in my head talking. I have to tell that weird voice, yes, yes, mm. because by spelling it out, we can make sure that we remain resolute, that we remain on track. Because it's so easy. Remember the, the, the bloody alcohol there? He's just ready mm-hmm. for us. So, you know, so th- these kind of discussions happen like like in a crazy person's kind of mm-hmm. <laughs> depiction in, in a Hollywood film. But mm-hmm. it is it is what happens in my head all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's luckily today I have, after seven years in, in recovery and very active in, in trying to gain new skills, I have... Uh, many of these tools on fast track. So I know how to switch them on. There are literally switches in my head that I can flitch a flip uh, mm. to switch. And suddenly uh, that new coping mechanism overrides whatever crappy thoughts are happening right. there. But that is something that needs training. And it's so wonderful that your brother actually went to meetings because if it is a good meeting, then people not just whinge about the old life, but they actually discuss, hey, I had a real shit day today. That happened. And I so wanted to drink. But instead, I did X, Y, Z. And the next right. guy says, oh, wow. Hey, you know what? I read this new book there. And this is really, really cool. And so spoke to me. Do you want to have a copy? Here, read it. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. what happens. This communication, this making it honest, this making it transparent, this, this getting up and say, yes, I'm a fucking alcoholic. And mm-hmm. no, I'm not proud of it. But I wear that scar because mm-hmm. it was my old me. And that old me has transformed now into this new me that is coming to the meeting to share, to mm-hmm. actually build up others, to to be transparent and to take the mask down, to actually mm-hmm. say, hey, guys, this is the real me. And yeah, and I think they really focus on, um, you know, and I know my brother still does this, that, you know, they don't talk about, you know, a month down the road, two months down the road, they really focus right on that day. And so he says, like, if it, that, that comes up, like you talk about that self talk, you know, that comes up that I want to have a drink. It's, well, I can drink tomorrow. I can get pissed drunk tomorrow. I'm just not going to get pissed drunk today. So I need to re, re, <laughs> find something else that's going to get my mind going. Um, But they don't worry about, they don't worry about a month from now or two months from now or a year from now. They just worry about, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's right down to every five minutes. You got to worry about not having a drink every five minutes. Mm -hmm. Then you break Mm -hmm. it down into little chunks and maybe that works for that person. Mm -hmm. And maybe those chunks become longer. Mm -hmm. Remember that though, there is this beautiful animal experiment where uh, uh, rats were put in cages and they had two presses. So they had the one presser, if they stand on it, they get water. And then if they get the other presser and they stand on it, they get water and heroin. And oh, su- yes. surprise, surprise, you know, the rats sort of figured out, oh, heroin is actually not bad shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> give me more <laughs> every time. Give me more. Then the researchers changed the whole thing. And this time they had still the same presses, etc. but they put now the rats into, uh, into a holiday park for rats. There were other <laughs> rats, sexy rats, rats with cool <laughs> things. And they did what rats do. They ran around and climbed and duck 
howls. Yeah. And now they had still the same choice between Harry and laced water and normal water. Guess what? They, when they, they were in a the holiday, water. that's right. Again and again. Because so the rats were far more interested in living a good life and figured out that actually the heroin doesn't really help them very much living a great life with the other rats. So how powerful is that? So it's the human connection. It's the, the creating micro habits that lead you towards a life that is so full and enriched and mm -hmm. Wow, you can't wait to get up out of the bed because you want to live that life. Mm -hmm. When you come to that point, alcohol or drugs simply have no role. I mm. just, yes, I get tempted to have from now and then think, ooh, that nice little Chardonnay or Gewürztraminer, a lovely mm. wine that I enjoyed. And I can sometimes see, we've had lovely crystal glasses. I can see the condensation on the outside when the sun is setting. A beautiful romantic kind of thing. But then I think, I'm going to feel like shit the next day. Will I get mm -hmm. up with the same beautiful Vigor? power? Yeah. No way. I'm going to be wiped out for the rest of the day. For two glasses of wine or a bottle? No, no. Yeah. So uh, no. therefore, that's that what you need to do. So it's one thing. And that's that's where I am critical of, of AA groups uh, and certainly of some of the groups that I attended in, in my initial recovery. They were so focused on not drinking. No one actually discussed dealing with the problems uh, mm -hmm. that people had and then creating that new life creating the micro habits to, right. to holding yourself accountable to actually do journaling, writing down yeah. your emotions, doing all those kind of things that, that actually reflect back to you. Okay. This was a shit day. And uh, interesting. I didn't actually have breakfast. I didn't actually drink any water. Surprised that by three o'clock in the afternoon, A, I was tired and B, I wanted to drink. And, yes. Uh, so <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. exactly. It's these kind of things. So now that's, ah, oh, my life is so different nowadays, but it's, it's different because I've learned what to do in, in the early stages of recovery and then fine tuned it. And whenever I speak to someone like you, I learn from you. I get reinforced by you. I get, I learn from, from your story, from your sharing. Another light goes on up there and it's just beautiful. Absolutely mm -hmm. beautiful. I love it. Oh, oh, here comes nice. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, excellent. Excellent. See, that is, and that is the human connection. That is a, a little dog like that who shows you the love, who shows you uh, the, what is important, okay, to live right now, right here. His, <laughs> his name is Rocky, and he was my dad's dog, actually. Oh yeah, so he's he's a good boy. He's the Aww. best boy. Yeah, he must be getting on a little bit now, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, he's a little sweetheart. Oh, and guess what? Guess what? That's what actually a lot of alcoholics are as well, little sweethearts, and it's just their shitty behavior. If you could just stop them doing that shitty addictive behavior suddenly mm -hmm. you you find that sweetheart again you find that mm -hmm. little that gem in there that is sometimes so hidden yeah so yeah if you guys out there if you have listened here today us us talking about the honesty of being children of alcoholics and and uh having an alcoholic tendency ourselves if you live with someone who is not on his best behavior because of the alcohol. Just don't forget that there is actually someone who is full of pain and hurt and shame and mm -hmm. guilt in there. And if you can just for a moment, maybe step outside of, of that little fight that might be going on right now between the two of you and actually think, hmm, okay, why is that? And okay, what can we actually do about it? Mm -hmm. there, there is help out there. I mean, there's so much out there. Uh, there's, uh, Michelle, I mean, uh, from your point of view, what would you recommend a friend who is is mm. who you recognize is in a similar boat as what mm. we have talked about? What would you tell them? 
Oh, that's a really tough question today. I will tell you. Um, yeah, I think um, like they say about, you know, suicide, they say if you recognize signs that someone might be experiencing depression where they may want to kill themselves, you have to ask them outright. You have to say, you know, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Are you thinking about, you know, committing suicide? Um, they want you know, the, the medical professionals are telling us you have to face that head on. Um, but maybe if I saw someone that was struggling now, I would say, you know, talk to me about whether or not you think that your drinking has become a problem. Hmm. Um, the problem is, is that when people are in denial about it, where do you go from there? Like, what, how, how do you have that conversation? If someone says, no, I'm not a drinker, or no, I didn't drink that, or no, I didn't get that DUI. <laughs> I mean, where, where, do you, where do you go? Buy my book and keep it I on. I actually summer. am going like, to buy Give it book. to them. <laughs> no, it's just, sometimes, sometimes to have something like that lying around is actually not a stupid idea because I had uh, given the book initially to some some alcoholic friends or friends in recovery now, uh, some of them relatively freshly in recovery. And they were saying, oh my God, I thought you were talking about me in your book. You were, you were talking, you know, the many little vignettes. I thought, mm -hmm. how did you know how I felt? And mm -hmm. it, it, is, it is just because we are very much brothers uh, and sisters in one big alcoholic sisterhood mm -hmm. and guess what wherever you come from it doesn't really matter what your skin color or what your religion if you are a friend with alcohol then your behavior is pretty similar to mine mm -hmm. and to all those other alcoholics out there to, mm -hmm. so let's be clear one in five one in five in the world wow. again yeah so these are huge numbers. So it is, uh, that is chemical addiction. Some people say one in three, but I'm a bit more conservative mm -hmm. in my quote. But bottom line is, you guys are not alone. You are not alone. So therefore, there are so many people out there who go through the same thing. And people who actually have managed to get through and are now living a very different life. And remember, if you wanted to put a, a power team together, because in business you want to, I don't know, you want to you want to open a restaurant, but you don't really know much about it. Well, you better get yourself a chef, you get a, a maitre d', you get some people who are good behind the bar because they've done it. You want to be the stupidest part of that team. Okay, you have got the money, you finance it, but still, you want the experts around you. Well, guess what? When it comes to recovery, don't listen to someone who is still drinking every day. They might not be the right people. Maybe mm -hmm. try to actually find those people that are clean and try, and not just because they're white knuckling it. I can do it. I see. I haven't right. drunken for 365 days and eight hours and 12 seconds. No, <laughs> that's not what I meant. I mean, those people who right. live a life that is beautiful. And so maybe look at AA. Uh, the 12 step programs because they're in so many, many places and they're mm -hmm. well recognized. And there's some really good meetings around. Um, there are some meetings around in AA that are not religious, that have, mm -hmm. you know, where God doesn't mean the deity, but a group of orderly drunks um, mm -hmm. or a group of druggies. So, however mm -hmm. you look at it. A smart recovery, uh, which is more a science-based approach to create that beautiful future and give you coping mechanisms. There's women in recovery. There's life ring. Uh, there's so many things. And since this is international, there's no way that I can tell you all the things that are out there. Right. They might be very country-specific, so I can't tell you. But what right. I can tell you is there is help. Mm -hmm. Okay. There is help for absolutely everyone out there. And even if there's no group immediately by, uh, start with your GP. Start with your family physician and actually just make an appointment and say, look, you know what? I actually think uh, I, in recent months, things are getting really close to me and I'm no longer as happy and I'm drinking far too much. And can I have a double appointment, please? And we have a chat. This will be so powerful. And I think, you know, it's hard to say, you know, how do you have a conversation with someone who is an alcoholic when 
That's a really strong word. Mm. I'll be honest with you. I remember when my brother had um, the interventionist. There was an interventionist that came to his house. My mom and I were both there and his wife and him. And he went over all of the, you know, the traits of an alcoholic. And I was like this. I was like, that's that's me too. Uh (laughs) You know, except I don't want to punch my neighbor out and I don't, um, you know, get blasted Mm -hmm. and kick things and wreck things and then go to sleep at six o'clock and, and, and say nasty things. Mm -hmm. Um, But but I was like, wait a second, that's a pretty loaded term as an alcoholic. Is there a way, and I know like this would be, is there a way there could be a term of that someone that might be struggling with drinking that isn't an alcoholic? Is mm-hmm. that possible? Um, no, I know you're going to say no. <laughs> uh, there are two schools of faults. Uh, one school says, actually, that is the basic key step for you to actually admit that you're an alcoholic. Mm. Not necessarily the uh, the I am an alcoholic, it's just a little trademark. No, uh, that you are powerless over alcohol, that alcohol is starting to win, something like that. You don't need to call yourself alcoholic, but that you're no longer happy. Um, Mm. So so there's that kind of school of thought. Um, In AA, it is, I'm an alcoholic, because only with that can you actually move forward. So step one is you recognize there's a problem. I'm an alcoholic. Step two and three is then that you know that you yourself can't do it all alone and that you need to find help and you believe that there's help out there. That's step two and three. So therefore, that's within the AA system. That's sort of, that's it. That's step one, two, and three. If you say, well, I'm not an alcoholic, well, then this AA system doesn't really work for you. Um, however, the, if you were to go to a smart choice um, eating, uh, eat there is, or to, to other, other systems, they rather focus on the future and say, okay, you got plastered because you were really, really pissed off then and then. You, I see the rage right now in your eyes. Oh, yeah. Okay, so tell us about that. And, oh, he did that. And, okay, so fair enough. And then, so they they then say, okay, what is the event? What are your beliefs around this event? And work with that. And maybe how could you rephrase that? And how could you deal with that if it was to happen again uh, in a different way so that the anger is not hurting you? And mm. maybe you can deal with the problem in a different way. Oh, yeah, okay, that would work. So they they arm you with a different coping mechanism. And right. now suddenly there is that need to drink might no longer be there in that particular situation. And then you yeah. learn other coping mechanisms for something else, etc. So by focusing more on the future and dealing with the problems, you you sort of deal with the alcohol itself. But yeah, hmm. one way or the other. What you have described perfectly was the withdrawal of your dad. So Mm -hmm. if you say, I have no problem with alcohol, and then stop drinking, and then end up crook and sick like a dog because you have got a massive food poisoning and a massive case of influenza at the same time, because these are the symptoms of a withdrawal. Well, there's only so much you can say, I'm not an alcoholic. Whilst Mm -hmm. if you actually see little things flying past you and see the spiders crawling on the wall yeah you're an alcoholic okay Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. that's the point and it's it's so hard so that is my take on things so is there a way yes as long as you get the help you don't Mm -hmm. need to label yourself um but hand on heart the sheer fact that you're that you're struggling with that question probably means you are And there is nothing wrong with that. Let's get that clear. It is mm-hmm. a coping mechanism that has been ingrained in you. And in many of you, there are the genes there to really set you up to live that life. That's it. Just as much as you've got the genes of having a big nose or curly hair or, I don't know, big feet. Mm-hmm. These are all genes. You can't do anything about that. You can't also do anything about the genes that have made you more susceptible to become uh, prey to alcohol. So it is what it is. 
But then again, let's be clear about that. Uh, if you are the daughter or the son of an alcoholic, then A, you are on the back foot with the genetics, but you also are so forewarned and therefore forearmed. Because if your dad has gone into recovery, like I'm now living such a beautiful life that hopefully my sons, whilst they have the genes, they actually see, wow, dad really got his shit together there. And look at that, you know, dad and mom never row because they actually use mindfulness and they actually are open. And if dad has a really shitty day, he comes home and he actually shares that. And he says, look, I feel really ratty. I was a crap of a day. I love you all to bits, but can I have 10 minutes for myself? Wow. Open, honest, bingo, done. Mm -hmm. So it's because we are alcoholics that can make us incredibly strong if we learn from the past, if we learn the coping mechanisms, and then share right now what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. That is powerful shit. That is only because my life has, has given me lemons doesn't mean to say that I can't make a beautiful lemonade out of that. Right. And that's, that's exactly how true. I would look at things. It's true. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I think, um, you know, just I look at, um, it's unfortunate that my father couldn't um, right the ship, really. He really couldn't. And it was a sad life for a long time for him. Um, and, you know, he only ever loved one woman. It was my mother. He never remarried. He never had another relationship um, after, you know, 1993. And, um, you know, he was adamant that, you know, he screwed up and, and he was embarrassed by it as well. Um, and I think, I think, um, you know, when I look at that and, you know, like when we, him and I used to talk, uh, which we talked all the time, um, you know, he, he wished that his life wasn't like that, but he was at the point where he was like, well, mm -hmm. what's the point now? Really? Like, there's what, what point do I have? I live in a shit apartment. My kids live away from me. They're older. Um, you know, I'm not married. I'm never going to get married again. Um, and this is it. This is all I got. Um, and I think it was just a really sad life. I really do. It's just too bad. Yet, yet. yet. But I would say to that, it is his choice. And mm -hmm. you, can, you can't change the once upon a time. You can't mm -hmm. change the past. But you can very much change how this book ends. You can change right now. You can choose to put that glass down. You can choose in the morning to get up and have a shower, have a shave, and go somewhere where you haven't been. To maybe, instead of dealing with the hangover and yearning for the next thing, see what could you could learn today. Is there a club that is open in something? Let's say... Mm -hmm you were always interested in, in playing bridge. And let's, let's say for the moment COVID is finished, okay? Um, okay? So go out there and why not learn how to play bridge if that is mm -hmm. something that you wanted to do? Learn photography. And nowadays you don't even need to, 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 to meet other people directly. There are virtual clubs where you can go out there, photography clubs where you go out with your camera. You can make that mm -hmm. call right now. Take your phone, the normal phone camera, and go out there, look on YouTube. How do you take pictures with your phone? Mm -hmm. And if you have an interest in photography, take photos. Enroll with a club. Do it. That is your choice right now. See, this is the thing, and I, I, I always struggle with that one a little bit because I can do all of that and more and still drink. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I get. I give you that. I give you that. Um, I can because I am an overachiever. So yeah. if there's like 24 hours in a day, I literally can go, okay, boom, 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 boom. And it's not, I'm not, um, I'm not bragging. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. saying like, I am a high achiever, uh -huh. an overachiever, and I get shit done. Uh -huh. And that's even with alcohol. <laughs> that's I can true. do that. Michelle, that's so up. I always <laughs> Michelle, I love it that you say that. I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, because at the moment, things seem to work for you. So mm -hmm. at the moment, um, if you're an alcoholic or not, that's a different question. Um, if, you, if you are actually content and happy with your life, 
why change? Uh-huh. Um, if yes, there are facts around the use of alcohol that we now know, know we now know that there is no safe limit. We now know that every glass of wine, every schnapps, everything you take will reduce your life expectancy. That is a fact. That is a given. We know the data. The, um, this is your choice. This is your choice. This is your life you live. If you're happy, if you're truly hand on heart, content, please live your life like that. No one says you have to change. Mm -hmm. If you suddenly have got problems in your life creeping up on you, like your health is deteriorating, like you're, you're, suddenly you get trouble with the law, suddenly you're thinking, bloody hell, I never have money. Well, just add up how much you drink and you suddenly find, shit, I've drank 10,000 last year. Mm -hmm. Now that's a lot of dollars, okay? Well, you know, if you bring, on, bring in 500,000 and you drink 10,000, who cares? Mm -hmm. If you bring in 12,000 and you drink 10,000, well, you get, this is, right. the, this is the inventory and you need to do. No one forces you to live your life one way or the other. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of it. You have choices. In the United States, in Canada, in much of the developed world, we have choices. We don't live in an in an environment where if we drink alcohol, we get our head chopped off. Um, right. Or, you know, there's, there's the freedom, freedom of expression, freedom of, mm -hmm. you know, everything. Cool. This is your freedom. But you also have got the freedom to choose a life that you find, yeah, I'm really, really proud of it. And if you hide, hide in front of your own mirror, huh, maybe it's time to change. Just a thought. Forget it. Don't, don't label yourself. Are you happy, yes or no? And if no, well, what could you do to make yourself happier? What, what is holding you back to live the life that you want to live? Yeah, I think, um, I think f for me, like I would say overall, I'm very happy. However, I don't think I need to drink the way that I drink, if I'm being honest with you, um, because I just don't think it's necessary. I don't feel like it serves me a purpose. And afterwards, I'm like, why did I even have that? Like, what was the point in having that? It didn't do anything for me. <laughs> um, and don't get me wrong, like I, I love a, a, a good glass of Pinot Grigio and I love to sit down in the, the summertime with my yeah. glass of wine, but really that just should be it. There doesn't need to be another one or three or four. There doesn't need to be. It doesn't serve the same purpose. <laughs> I feel like I'm always chasing the first <laughs> glass the way that the first glass tastes. No, you're not after the taste how it makes you feel, how yes. it makes the, the promises that it gave you. Mm -hmm. So that is, that is what you need to, to figure out. What are you chasing? Do you want to be young again? Do you want to be 18 and, and, and stupid in your head and dance the night away? Well, mm. okay. So learn to dance the tango kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. you know? So kind of a, what are you chasing? What does your, what is, <laughs> there's a, a series called Lucifer and uh, Lucifer, he is, that, is, yes. he is the devil and he has got, his, his hallmark is, what is your deepest inner desire? And he can make people tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And so I, I say that, what is your deepest inner desire? Imagine the red eyes now. Um, <laughs> that is what you need to figure out. And Your guess is as good as mine. I have no clue. I just like <laughs> wine. <laughs> okay, then that's easy. If that is your desire, then you've nailed it. But I what, know. What, what makes you feel funny? So, and don't answer that now. Don't answer that now. I, I put that seat into the ground and you, you just water that seat and you actually think about I will. what is. I will. What is <laughs> and there is no right answer. And that answer is unique for each and every one. Find mm -hmm. your why. I think the why is the key thing. And we say that in investment and in business, what is your why? And mm -hmm. once you figure that out, then you can move forward. If you can't find a why, and if it is actually quite nice, the life you're living. 
Exactly. Fair enough. I'll think <laughs> about it. <laughs> uh, Michelle, thank you so much for such a thought-provoking and actually beautiful discussion. And that is, there's so many women and men out there who are exactly in your boat, Michelle. So it's mm -hmm. powerful, powerful what we have done here today. It is honest to the to the nth degree, and it's, uh, for that, I am so grateful for your honesty, for your humility, for your transparency. Because that's so missing in today's world. Who who would ever open up like that? And how beautiful is it? Because now we've we've explored some bits there and and you made me think about some things in my life. And uh, I will I will go away from this interview and I will think, well, hmm, hmm, hmm. You stirred things up. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful because that's how we grow and that's how we, how we mature and learn new things. Well, I could say the same thing about you. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, thank you so much for coming onto my show. And you guys out there, you look after yourself and have a fantastic time and make the most out of this life. You've only got one. Uh, so go for it. This is your time. <laughs> Bye. Bye.